Okay, uh, we're ready to uh, continue here. Uh, yeah. My name is Ben Jorns. I'm in the Aerospace Engineering Department where I research uh, plasma propulsion systems and low temperature plasmas. And I build just embarrassingly simple models compared to what we're learning about here today. So it's a real privilege to watch this research. And it's a real privilege to introduce our next speaker, Professor Amitabha Bhattacharji, who comes to us from Princeton University, also my alma mater, uh, <coughs> where he was Oh, speak up a little bit more? Okay, yeah. Um, I'll move it up. Uh, who comes to us from Princeton University, where he is the head of the theory department from 2012 to 2021. Before joining that, he held a number of prestigious positions, including the Paul Professor of Space Science at the University of New Hampshire, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Iowa, and Associate Professor of Applied Physics at Columbia University. A copy of his textbook rests comfortably on my shelf and has dog-eared pages in it. His students and doctoral colleagues have just had an impressive number of contributions in the field, including over 300 refereed publications. He has served on the board of American Physical Society, was a chair of the APS Division of Plasma Physics, APS Topical Group in Plasma Astrophysics founder, the senior editor of the journal Geophysical Research, Space Physics from 2006 to 2009. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Associate of Advancement of Science, and the American Geophysical Union. His research interests are wide and varied, including magnetic connection, turbulence, kinetic theory, free electron lasers, and complex plasmas. And he was recently recognized by one of the most prestigious awards in the field of plasma physics, which is the James Clerk Maxwell Prize in Plasma Physics. So without further ado, please welcome our next speaker. Thank you, Ben, for that very kind introduction. Somehow when you say all those things, it doesn't seem like me. Uh, I'm very pleased to be back uh, in my alma mater where my education in plasma physics actually began. With somebody in the Department of Nuclear Engineering, uh, a much revered uh, faculty member um, in the department, and for me personally, who was an inspiration, Professor Zia Chasu, who passed away a few years ago. But I owe my great love of plasma theory and non-equilibrium statistical mechanics to Professor Akchasu's very inspiring lectures. Professor Dudastat was in those days a faculty member in the Department of Nuclear Engineering as well. And he had very interesting lectures on neutron transport theory that I also learned from, uh, and I can go on and on about the many wonderful colleagues in the Department of Nuclear Engineering who taught me a great deal. And after I learned from them all I could, I went to Ben's institution to complete my doctoral studies, and uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that the circle keeps getting more and more completed with more and more students, colleagues, who circle back into this university and continue what I think is a very strong link with this campus. So it was my hope that Doug Cote will speak before me and uh, I have no desire to steal his thunder, nor uh, do I think I ever can. He is the director of the Exascale Computing Project, which has provided a very major impetus to the project I'm about to describe. I will not try to substitute for all that Doug will tell you, though uh, the previous speaker already introduced to you what a revolution it has been uh, for the application projects to have Frontier uh, at Oak Ridge and Aurora uh, about to become available to uh, many of us uh, in Argonne. But let me begin with one project in the Exascale Computing Project uh, that Doug leads, which is uh, the whole device model of magnetically confined fusion plasma, otherwise known as WDM app. If you make a mistake and permute DNM, it can end up being WMD, and I want to emphatically stay away from that. Uh, the uh, 
main thing that I want to suggest to you is that fusion program, which as you know, is experiencing a very major resurgence, both in the DOE Office of Sciences as well as through private investment, has come to the point where modeling using uh, supercomputers will play a very important role, I believe, in actually choosing the next design of a fusion power plants. Not that it can ever be a substitute for experiments, but we can't build thousands of billion dollar experiments. We have to be selective on what we build, and I therefore think that computer simulations will have to be a major guide in our choices. So this is a project of accelerating fusion through whole device model of magnetically confined fusion plasma. It's a group I lead as PI and C.S. Chang from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory is a wonderful co-PI to work with. Uh, this is a multiple institution group composed of national laboratories, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, as I mentioned already, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and universities, uh, University of Texas at Austin, once at Boulder, University of Colorado, the University of Utah, RPI, University of New Hampshire, and even a private company, Jubilee Development, which is part of this enterprise. Uh, it's an astoundingly talented group, and a lot of the progress that I'm about to describe to you is attributable to the early career and mid-career people who dominate the program now, uh, and I speak for them. I'm very fortunate to be associated with them. Uh, words of wisdom from one of our heroes in physics, and uh, he had amazing foresight about a lot of things. And even though he was a very fundamental physicist himself, he said something important, that he thought that what will be important in the 21st century will be the integration of knowledge provided by complex models to understand, predict, and control the performance of fusion experiments, and he was a big fan of fusions. But he made his comment more generally, and when he said, I think the 21st century will be the century of complexity. We have already discovered the basic laws that govern matter and understand all the normal situations. We don't know how the laws fit together and what happens under extreme conditions. There is no limit to the complexity we can build using those basic laws. And you will see in my talk an example of exactly uh, that, what he had in mind. So if one thinks of a whole device model hierarchy, and you ask yourself, what does it mean to say that you have a whole device model? Because models can have various levels of description. And the way I like to think about it, and this is a nice cartoon due to Jeff Candy of General Atomics, is that at the apex, of this pyramid, you have what you might call a, a basic first principle simulation. Uh, this will take the fundamental equations, in my particular case of plasma physics, and that generally means some sort of a kinetic model from which other fluid models are derived by taking moments. A well-known procedure in most books in uh, statistical mechanics, especially non-equilibrium ones. Leadership class computing facilities are out there at the very apex to give those answers, which because they're determined by uh, fundamental equations could be thought of as definitive values if all things are right. Uh, but those are often very expensive computing uh, models, but what do they actually provide and why are they so essential? There are a whole lot of reduced models that we can actually use to model plasmas and they would fit into the second category. And these are often faster to run and they can often, if designed suitably, uh, can be quick enough that you can run on a laptop or even a small workstation 
and in some cases, if you're fortunate, can be synchronized with experiments. They often have coefficients in them that one fits phenomenologically, a very valuable service. But the coefficients that you obtain in doing that uh, should be one that should be derivable from first principles. And it is in some sense that holy grail that one is really after. These intermediate scale models have enormous applications, particularly if you put in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and you automate them. You can run them and produce large computing data sets and obtain from them what you think would be the very best ones. So there is no process by itself. This pyramid really needs all its levels in order to be a fully functional entity, and not all of which may require exascale computing. But exascale is at the apex of it, and in some sense provides ultimate computational validation of a lot of phenomenology that goes after. And therefore, when I emphasize fundamental principles of the exascale, please don't uh, uh, think that that is, uh, uh, in any sense, uh, uh, dismissive of what lies below, without which we would not be able to have the detailed verification and validation program, which is at the heart uh, of a lot of uh, computing. Now, plasma physics, especially fusion physics, is a poster child in many ways for the Dewey uh, Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research. And that is because at every stage of our game, the hunger for supercomputing facilities has been so great in fusion physics that every time the Department of Energy has given us more computing power, we have actually done more physics with it. So it isn't that our physics was solved at the level of gigaflops. We had incomplete physical models because we couldn't do enough. For example, if you look at the fusion literature at about that time, you will find things like electrostatic ion physics in simplified cylindrical geometry, pretty much chewing up all the computers that there was. Then came the era of the teraflop, when we could do five-dimensional ion scale electromagnetic physics in a torus. We are beginning to tackle the edge, but we couldn't do it any more than electrostatic and we couldn't do electromagnetic problems. Came the era of the petaflop, when we could actually do both ions and electron physics. Uh, and however, with rather incomplete separation of scales, the exaflop era really brought home to us. And that's the era we are in now, where we can actually do five dimensional. And I want to explain to you what five dimensional you might think, because when you think of kinetic models, you generally think of three spatial coordinates and three momentum coordinates. That really makes six-dimensional phase space. When I say five dimensions, what do I mean? I mean that there is a very strong magnetic field about which particle generation is so rapid that you can average out that particular time scale, so the angle phi which tracks the motion of a charged particle about a magnetic field is averaged out. Then in coordinates, you can actually have five d phase space, and that is what is called the model of gyrokinetics. That's been enormously useful in fusion plasmas as well as in astrophysical plasmas and space plasmas for rapid representation of plasma particles, which have the advantage of exploiting the fact that the Lama radius of the particle is a lot smaller than the system size. So when you get to the era of the exaflop is where we are having five-dimensional electromagnetic study of plasmas. Now we can make them ITER relevant. ITER is the big uh, fusion plasma experiment, as you know, uh, and, and cited in Cadarache, France, with eight nations and a huge budget, $20 billion, which should have its first plasma. It has been delayed. And it has had project overruns, but it's a major engineering feat. And if you haven't been to Kadarash, uh, I urge you strongly uh, to visit. I have not seen a more spectacular uh, experiment that is being built. Um, I wish it were done sooner. And I wish it were done less expensively. But that's a separate issue. So what we are looking at today is to try to model each of great plasmas using our whole device model. Beyond, we have whole facility. 
because the science is where the focus of this particular project has been. But if fusion is to become a reality, we have to integrate that with the entire infrastructure that goes with the engineering of fusion reactors, a lot of which has things in common with what also took fission to work. And so there's a lot in the nuclear engineering. We don't inherit the radiation problem, and so we are fortunate that fusion is still classified as a green technology by people who know. But on the other hand, the infrastructure that we, engineering infrastructure that we know that nuclear engineering have excelled at is also something that we would like to learn from. And it is in the combination of science and engineering that the feasibility of a final fusion facility will be determined. And that lies beyond. We are beginning to do some of that work in the exaflop era, and we must. But we also look to uh, the next era of computing. So what is it that is the vision of WDMR? What I wanted to tell you is that this is a seven-year project that comes to end this year, as Doug will tell you. And the most challenging part of the problem was actually to produce a kinetic description, a first principles description of the plasma in a torus. And what had happened in the fusion community is the problem at the edge and the problem in the core are somewhat different problems. Even though they obey the same kinetic equation, if you just try to use the same equation in the core as well as the edge, you actually run into very major computational challenges. So people have tended to separate the core and the edge, for reasons that I'll give you, uh, into two separate models. What WDMAP tries to do is to produce a synthesized model which does the first complete model of the plasma integrating core with the edge. Whereas the edge is described by the full distribution function and its non-equilibrium evolution near the edge, which happens at a much more rapid time scale. The core, which is much more collision-less, the background distribution function doesn't evolve all that much, but the fluctuations on it evolve very rapidly. And even though we have the same equation underlying it, the versions of the equation that we integrate in the core and the edge are somewhat different. The core equations are an approximate form of the full equations, and it has its own algorithm. The integration accomplishes that. And this is tightly coupled, as I will describe to you. On top of that, you have all the challenges of plasma material interactions, radio frequency and neutral beams, MHT behavior of the whole system, energetic particle physics. All of these are to be added as special modules to this core whole device model. And my work primarily today that I'll be describing for the whole group is our success in having <coughs> achieved that integration so far. Now, just to show you why I think this is a big deal, I'd like you to look at the core plasma simulations of the core gene and the edge plasma simulation for the code XGC, which had been there in the community for a very long time, uh, predating the inauguration of the exoscale era. And if you look at it, the core is actually evolving on a slower time scale with very different spatial structures than the edge, which is much more rapid and has very different kinds of structures. This separation of time scales is a crucial asymptotic parameter that separates core physics from edge physics. The edge physics requires a full F description. You cannot linearize the F around some background and in delta F, whereas the center one you can. The integration, therefore, of a delta F algorithm with a full F algorithm is what was the major challenge for this whole device model. Furthermore, the left results are actually coming from a continuum code, which actually integrates the PDEs directly, uh, whereas the right-hand side is from a particle in cell representation, which is equivalent in mathematical terms but the techniques required are very different. So what were the principal WDMAP goals when we started out on this seven-year journey? 
First of all, the demonstration and assessment of a whole device model, gyrokinetic physics, and experimental transport time scale in a challenge problem for pedestal formation in, in, a, in a fusion plasma. And I'll explain what the pedestal is in a moment. We must do so, we were told by the ECP, uh, at a figure of merit no less than 50. Because if you look at going from, say, Titan, which seems ancient today, to the frontier, there is a factor of eight involved already, eight to 10, depending on your problem, in terms of sheer computing power. So if you took the same code and you scaled it, you could say naively you get a figure of merit of 10. That's not enough. You must have enough algorithmic enhancements in order to get to uh, 50. You'll be pleased to know that we have met that guideline and more, but I'll save that for a little later in the talk. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, uh, just to tell you that we just ran on Frontier and we have achieved a figure of merit of 150, which I think Doug is very pleased about. Uh, he never tells me that uh, in public, but every now and then uh, when he threatens to take my funding away, there's always a wink in his eye about the fact that we finally met the FOM that he set us up to do, and we have. Furthermore, we wanted to set up an integration framework, uh, which we call end-to-end -end framework for fusion integrated simulations, which I hope will provide a framework that will bring in other codes, not just the codes that we are talking about here. That's our aspiration. Now, I must forewarn you that plasma codes are not like climate modeling codes in the sense that in climate modeling, they've achieved the ideal uh, uh, quite a bit of what I would call plug and play in some frameworks where you can bring in codes. And I would call them in the weak coupling mode in the sense that you don't need to really couple distribution functions for the codes to speak to each other. Here, what we are really talking about is sharing particle distribution functions across the core and the edge, which is a much more detailed level of modeling. So what is this challenge problem that we told the ECB project we will solve? This is actually the heart of the matter for each are performing and meeting its fusion goals. It wants to operate in what is called the high mode, abbreviated as the H mode, where the pressure profile is expected to have this, pe this pedestal and then a rapid uh, uh, going to zero near the edge. The maintenance of this pedestal depends on critical plasma parameters and heating power and so on and so forth. And the prediction of the pedestal height and width is one of the primary inputs into ITER modeling going forward. That is what we have targeted to predict for ITER using realistic ITER parameters. So that's a much larger volume, but it also must predict this. This has not been done before. And so, what have we done? What we have done is, this is <coughs> sort of gives you an insight in how we proceeded. So we have one code, HTC, which is the edge code in the plasma, which is a particle end code. It's in fact the only full edge code that is now there, which is highly performant on GPUs and has been shown to be highly performant on Frontier that is coupled to a core code of the kind that you saw in the movie, gene, or any other code. We have also a co one continuum code and a particle in cell code that we bring in. Both we brought into the project, one for the explicit purpose of coupling, the other for risk prevention, and we are actually trying to do this FOM that I told you about, the figure of merit with both classes of codes with XGC. So we proceed typically in two steps. First, we do XGC XGC modeling, where XGC is doing delta F, and XGC runs in F. If you can't get that to work, there is no way in which you can remove XGC in the core and bring in another code and get that to work as well. So we do that as a first step. Then we bring in gene or gem, which is a core code to couple them. And we have done this now successfully and very quickly. The coupling accomplishments between XGC and gene is that we have done linear and nonlinear electrostatic adiabatic electrons and circular geometry. We have done it with realistic D3D fusion plasma device. 
and calculated pedestal gradient. We've also done more advanced electron models, which we call kinetic models. And the challenges to address between the codes has been one of variable time stepping, the time integration, and the field equations, which are common. They're, they're basically Maxwell's equations that we are solving in the entire domain while we are coupling these. This is an enormously complex problem. This is a result from XGC and uh, Gene, as well as uh, our couple runs, all showing together. I'll show you more detailed quantitative comparisons. And you can see that we have been able to reproduce reference runs from this couple code in a robust way. Here is our a movie of now XGC gem coupling, where gem is now being uh, running in the core, a delta F particle in cell code. And what you will see here is a region which is, we deliberately put in the coupling region because that is the hardest part of the simulation domain, where they are actually joined together with a buffer. And what you see is the development of an instability, the ion temperature gradient instability, tracked by the edge core on the one hand and the core code on the other until it runs to saturation. And let me take you to the results. If you think of the fact that the uh, XGC code is a particle and cell code which has noise in it, and the continuum code is one which has very little noise in it, you will find that the agreement in linear growth rate is really good, but what is more impressive is that we have been able to converge in solutions for the uh, couple system, obtaining an agreement on heat flux or thermal flux prediction, which is a very important prediction for ITER, which is an agreement to less than 5%, for given the presence of statistical noise in the PIC codes and the absence of it in, in the continuum codes which have their own challenges, it's a striking agreement. And below the experimental bar, that's actually measurable. We had a contract with the ECP. This is a 413.3B project in the DOE. And I don't know whether those numbers mean anything to you, but people who run major facilities, experimental facilities, know what those numbers mean. It means you set tight milestones. You meet all of them. If you don't, you will have a, a price to pay. It's just not a very negotiable entity. So you set reasonable conservative milestones and you meet them. I'm pleased to tell you that the project has met all its milestones so far and we have survived uh, the scrutiny. Uh, so one was the mere challenge of getting the figure of merit right. And as I told you already, you're comparing now full frontier at 1.6 exaflops compared with the figure of merit, which was at a 27 petaflop machine. And that has to be greater than factor of 50. And there were two measurements that was required of us. One is that we should show that XGC itself, which takes up most time in the coupling, is itself performant along with the others. But the performance of XGC was very important. And the other is that the coupled code also performed at a very high FOM, and that has the coupling in it. And that coupling could slow you down because the time scales of integration between the core and the edge are very different. Well, I don't want to bore you with the definition of the FOM, uh, just to let you know that the FO, uh, there's one thing that you should know that unlike many other projects in the ECP, Fusion had a very major challenge. There had never been a coupled code before the ECP started. So the model we started out with was really the XGC FOM uh, that we had on Titan. That set the benchmark for us. Now we had to produce a much faster and a much more performant code later on. And let me not go into the details of the FOM. This was all determined in close consultation with the computer scientists and applied mathematicians who make up the ECP project. By the way, it's one of the Doug is not here, so I can tell you it's probably one of the most competent and demanding offices that we've ever dealt with. I say both with a great deal of pleasure because it's very, very nice to be able to deal, as you heard from the opening talk this morning, 
with project directors or project managers who are keenly interested in the science you do and actually ask you searching and probing questions to see how well you're doing. We certainly have had that in this facility. So here is our report now. This is barely six weeks old. We were given uh, 10 days on Frontier to run with WDMAP. And what you're seeing here, CPU-only MPI and GPU-aware MPI, and the talk that you heard this morning on data sharing and others is extremely important. And as uh, he told you, and rightly so, the data management is a very, very important part of the enterprise. It's not just computing. And we've had very significant help from Oak Ridge National Laboratory in terms of having a group which built the framework which does a lot of the in-situ data management. And you're seeing GPU-aware MPI, CPU-only MPI. We learned by running that these things do affect, and we achieved uh, 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 FOM of 150 with ITER electromagnetic uh, making predictions. This was not a problem run to saturation because we didn't run it for as long as it would take. We didn't have the time to run it in 10 days because a lot of the nodes crashed. Uh, this is the running phase. Getting a booting a new machine is a hazardous enterprise, and we are the guinea pigs in that. We went up to 6,000 nodes, but we couldn't get, and that was the most that was made available to us, and that's the number we are reporting. And with XGC and Frontier, uh, similarly reported about 136 factor FOM. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. So what does this mean for fusion energy sciences? The ITER whole volume simulation that took 150 days on Titan before ECP can now be performed on one day on Frontier for both WDM app coupled coder XGC. And for those of you who haven't visited Frontier, I strongly urge you to do that. If you go and stand before one of the shelves of Frontier, it's amazing to imagine that the computer that is now being phased out, which is next door, Summit, which also occupies a floor, that power is now contained on one shelf. And if that doesn't give you goosebumps, I don't know what will. You're looking at a really amazing machine with amazing capability. And you have to wonder that if you don't rise to the challenge of making full use of the machine, your competitor will. So my rule in thumb is never argue against supercomputing. Learn how to use it. You will turn it to your advantage in complex problems. And if you don't, then we are the loser for it. Supercomputing doesn't solve everything, but supercomputing does give you the enormous power to get to answers in complex problems that you can't get otherwise. And I'm a pen and pencil theorist. So, uh, what I want to show you is a, I know this is a little bit of a high level talk, uh, but I wanted to convey to you the complexity of the task, and I'm not doing justice to all the wonderful pieces of physics that I'd love to spend time on. And if, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. I, I'll get into some really interesting f uh, fundamental physics in, in the five minutes that I have. Oh, that, that's very kind, thank you. So what I want to talk to you about is this um, general uh, framework. It's an exascale framework uh, that has been led from Oak Ridge, which actually uh, sets up how we uh, developed a general framework for coupling codes. And as you know, the dream of WDM app is not only to get kinetic coupling to get a whole device model, but also to bring in other pieces of science in. And so this is actually a, a workflow, if you will. It facilitates easy integration to analysis and visualization tools, components, frameworks. And the unique features are in situ memory-based data movement, exactly the kind of things that you heard that Legion does. And I would love to find out how one can actually use Legion, which we haven't used yet. And today was a learning day for me in that respect. But also exactly the points that were emphasized, how we move data around. And we are using some of the older tools. Cocos is a very important tool for us. And this turned out to be a very important tool for us to interface Fortran C++ codes, couple them, and run them on FS 2.0. And our goal is to actually make, at the end of this period, FS 2.0 available to the Fusion community. 
But using up this framework will require uh, people to actually get extra skill resources that can only be gotten through insight and other programs that you have to compete for. And we really hope that people who want to use this framework will. Now, what I want to talk to you about is something uh, which is a little bit more physics. That is what we have done towards whole device model of a tokamak plasma. But the question that you can ask me, how are you going to use all this? And what problem in fusion are you going to solve? And obviously, we have targeted ITER. ITER will, if everything goes according to plan, exceed Q by far. 10, not just 1. It's a complex machine. But there are two problems in running tokamaks. And the two problems in tokamaks that are the subject of intense research, this is what keeps tokamak fusion people up at night, which is that they need a plasma current. The system is beautiful. It's axisymmetric. That is a great strength. But axisymmetry by Maxwell's equations require that you must have a current flowing in the plasma. Gold B equals J. Most people who do electromagnetics know this simple equation, and you insist that if it is access symmetry, then you must have a current flowing through it. You have no two ways around it. That current is the source of many instabilities that can disrupt the plasma. The other is that current also needs to be driven. So if you want to get to a steady state machine, you have to really not run the current in pulse mode, but run steady state. And these are the two principal challenges that tokamak people face. If the current disrupts, it's well known from French super tokamaks that you produce a beam of runaway electrons that, when it hits the plasma, can melt the plasma locally. And the control of that, of that disruption and mitigation is one of the major challenges. Lyman Spitzer, who actually uh, started the fusion program, did not go the axisymmetric way. His idea was, and this was probably the most beautiful idea in fusion physics, he said he wanted to build a device without a plasma current, which he called a figure eight stellarator. And his ingenuity was that if you take a torus, a donut, and you twist it and make it into a figure eight, you will destroy its axis symmetry. It will become fully three-dimensional magnetic field. But that magnetic field, from pure topological considerations, can produce the co complex magnetic field that you need for a fusion plasma, which combines a toroidal field as well as a poloidal field. It was a topological intuition years ahead of its time. Quantum mechanicists later on found this to be what they call the Berry phase. And I don't go into the history of that. It's a favorite topic. It would take another hour. But he got this idea on a ski slope. He liked to climb mountains. And when he couldn't have mountains, he climbed buildings. There are stories about his climbing the graduate college at Princeton overnight. And it was very nice uh, practice. And the police had to chase him down not to do hazardous things. And this is the only equation that I'll actually show you in the whole talk. Forgive my uh, uh, theory inclinations. It turns out that why stellarators have had a real resurgence, so the complexity of stellarators were always that they were three-dimensional magnetic fields, and they require complex topologies. If you write down the Lagrangian, which every physicist likes to do for a charged particle, you will find that the answer depends on the vector potential A, which is fully three-dimensional. But then if you gyro average that Lagrangian, you come to a remarkable fact that the Lagrangian depends not on the vector b, but on the magnitude of b. This actually raises a very interesting possibility. What if your vector b is fully three-dimensional? But really, the Lagrangian that controls your particle depends only on the magnitude of b. So if you can make the magnitude of b dependent on only two coordinates, they may be somewhat special coordinates, and the third coordinate will be ignorable. And that, by Noether's theorem, is going to give you a conserved quantity which will confine charged particles. In the axis symmetric torus, that symmetry is out there for you to see. It's the phi coordinate, and it has a very nice momentum conservation law that goes with it that ties the charged particles to magnetic surfaces. In the stellarator with three-dimensional magnetic fields, there is a hidden symmetry. And that hidden symmetry comes about through this. And what people therefore figured out very ingeniously is how to build 
three-dimensional magnetic fields which have the property that the magnitude of B depends on only two coordinates. It's called quasi-symmetry. And quasi-symmetry has opened up a whole new area of research, not only in fusion plasma physics, but broadly more mathematically. And what you're seeing here are things that have been built at Madison. In fact, with the magnetic field, as you can see, this is as a helical. Uh, the Madison experiment had a helical magnetic field. But if you follow along a field line, you actually find, if you go along that, that B is actually constant along those field lines. And this has actually been built and plasma contained. And the most spectacular version of something that is close to quasi-symmetry is the Wendelstein stellarator in Germany, which now, uh, this is from a, a science paper in 15, which has been built according to computer models, has remarkable confinement of particles, and has met every specification required of it. And that was designed 30 years ago. Now we can do a lot better. And what happened is, uh, about uh, four years ago, uh, Jim Simons, who, as you know, is a mathematician and actually has the Simons Foundation, which supports long-term research, I actually persuaded him, along with a very talented group of people, to start what we call the Hidden Symmetries and Fusion Energy Project, which essential goal was to develop a sophisticated computational product which will very rapidly design stellarators using state-of-the-art computing tools. We developed, as a result of this, the Simons Optimization Code, which uses the full power of parallel computers. It's a multi-institutional, international team, because Simons, unlike the DOE, actually funds people in UK, Germany, and Australia. And together, this group has done marvelous things, including producing designs that have shown that particle confinement, high energy particle confinement, exceeds that of even axisymmetric devices. Because the flexibility we have in three-dimensional geometry through quasi-symmetry gives us this control. And now we, we have actually in the process of doing magnet designs. So what I want to tell you is the entire power of the WDMF framework now has ready for it to build stellarator relevant whole device models that I hope will be the next challenge that the WDMF model will take up. My conclusions, and thank you for your patience, that I believe WDMF will deliver a computational tool of unprecedented power, exploiting the full potential of Frontier and Aurora. This has met every milestone exceeding the FOM 50 criterion by a factor of three. Uh, and I hope we will do better as we have more and more of Frontier available to us. We focused here on two primary goals, which is coupling of core gyrokinetic code and edge gyrokinetic code and performance of the coupled code, and the development of a user-friendly, extensible framework for code coupling in WDMF. Further development of WDMF for stellarators and other con concepts, I hope other people will do in the years ahead. And I should tell you that Hawking's vision that the science is extremely interesting in complex systems, you have emerging facts that you don't get from each of the individual models, is coming to pass. And integrated with engineering, we hope will enable the first principles modeling of fusion power plants of the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that wonderful talk, and we have time for a couple questions. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of respond. Okay, there we go. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the coupling in terms of um, like looking towards coupling other codes in the future, like some tips and tricks for kind of some major pitfalls you found that are kind of important to avoid? Sure. Um, I can tell you that the challenges are different depending on what type of codes you're trying to couple. In our case, um, we have some mathematicians who are also involved in the problem. Uh, and uh, therefore, we did some simple problems first, like advection diffusion systems and things like that. And one of the things that you face right away in order to 
control your time is what level of data are you going to exchange between the two domains, the core domain and the edge domain. That's one. The second one is when you're solving Maxwell's equations, do you have just each domain solve its own field equations? Or do you have one field solver for the entire domain? We found that the numerical instabilities, when we actually do the field solves in each domain separately. Uh, it was anticipated by this mathematical work, which on advection diffusion equations, but the physicists, as you know, uh, they go way beyond the scope of a simple advection diffusion problem that they tried it out, and surely enough, we understood that this was something that we had to do. In the process, we uncovered a few more things for the applied mathematicians to now prove theorems about on what kind of stable algorithms we will actually have. Then it came to the question of F, and what you're really doing is that you're actually merging codes with different time steps on the left and the right. And if there are issues of phasing of information, you can introduce Fourier phases that will actually decorrelate the turbulence and make you feel that you're doing better at controlling turbulence physically than you're actually really doing. And this is a numerical artifact that took us time to get over. It was all cured because we had nice reference models where we saw this was not happening. It's tricky business. Uh, and hydrodynamics people told us that this was something that they had tried in the area of neutral fluids. And they had a lot of trouble with people in Livermore in particular, and very good people at that. Phil Colella and a whole bunch of other people who had tried uh, these sort of things. We found a way around many of these difficulties. And getting the codes to be robust is another big challenge. So I just mentioned to you two things. Now, if you couple a kinetic code with a fluid code, there you can actually you have boundary conditions to worry about because they're going from a higher degree of system to a lower degree. Then the fidelity of the boundary conditions coming from the left and how they match on to a, a, a kinetic code, you have to do multi-scale methods, which really is course graining in time. It's called time telescoping techniques that we have to implement. And those have been pursued too in the program. But in the main project, we still haven't coupled this coupled code to say, an MHD code. That's a task for the future. Lots to talk about, perhaps, over coffee. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I, had a, I was a little bit unclear about use of the phrase first principles. Um, you do seem to be coupling different codes, operating at different fidelities. Um, to me, first principle is some underlying uh, physics that you cannot go below, yeah. right? So is this first principles, or that's a common terminology in your field? No, no. When I meant first principles, I meant first principles. In other words, if you open chapter one of a plasma kinetic theory book, you will find a, what you would see a variant of the Boltzmann equation. If you and I agree that the Boltzmann equation is a fundamental equation of kinetic theory, then we are talking about the same thing. The gyrokinetic model is actually derived from the Boltzmann equation with only one rigorous mathematically justifiable operation, which is that if you have a very strong magnetic field, you average out Boltzmann and get rid of the rapid gyro phase motion. What you end up with are what are called the gyrokinetic equations. Those are the five-dimensional equations that I was talking about. Now, every fluid description in plasma physics is derivable from the gyrokinetic equation from first principles. So I think if you solve the gyrokinetic equation in a strongly magnetized plasma, most plasma physicists would stay, say that is what would be a first principle model. And the coupling of the two codes that we are talking about here are done with the same gyrokinetic equation. It just is that the core, we make a further approximation that delta F the variation from the total F is smaller than F0, whereas in the edge, the total F is integrated. They are then coupled. Would you agree with me that that's first principle enough? Um, I do not know. Um, OK. Maybe any approximation made based, based on other kinds of 
Okay, so uh, th this is. No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know because I don't know the terminology in your field. What I was going to say is that uh, the, uh, there are reviews of modern physics articles where people have shown this using Hamiltonian methods and so on and so forth, where this has been, this state of the art has been worked on and refined. Where you're right, though, if I, am, if I actually interface a kinetic code with an MHD code, there I'm mixing models. And you're absolutely right, because the MHD model is a fluid model. It doesn't have detailed kinetics in it. But it was the coupling for the whole device kinetic model that I was referring to as the first principles model. I <laughs>